السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين uh, As usual we'll begin with listening to a recitation So today we'll listen from verse number one up to verse number ten So you have the paper in front of you, you can follow with the recitation Okay, this is among the surahs that were revealed in Mecca and we said before there is always a difference between the surahs that were revealed in Mecca and those that were revealed in Medina. The ones that were revealed in Mecca, they concentrate on At-Tawheed, worshipping Allah alone, uh, denouncing idol worship. And the ones that were revealed in Medina, they talk about details. So after you believe, then you have to worship. So they give you the details on how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And mostly the verses that were revealed in Mecca, they begin with Ya Ayyuhan Nas in most cases. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing everyone, Muslims as well as non-Muslims. But the ones that were revealed in Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins in most cases with Ya Ayyuhan Ladina Amanu or you who have believed. So in Mecca it was a time of doing da'wah to the disbelievers, to the polytheists. So in Medina, this is when people had become Muslims and the faith was so strong in them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, over there, he was addressing them as, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. And we said that the verses that were revealed in Mecca are shorter than the ones which were revealed in Medina. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to take them gradually into understanding the message. So this is a person who has concerns about the message, who doesn't believe in the message. So if you give him a lot of details, he might be distracted. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started with them gradually until when they believe, then he gives them a lot of details. So as usual, we will begin with keywords that will, under, will help us understand the verses better and more. So here we have the word Al-Muhl. Al-Muhl has so many connotations. One of them is مَا ذَابَ مِنَ الْمَعَادٍ كَالْفِضَّةِ وَالنُّحَاسِ وَالرَّصَاسِ وَغَيْرِهَا So these minerals or, mat or, or metals, when they melt, we call them Muhl. For example, Fidda means silver, Nuhas, copper, Rasas, lead. And actually for those who are learning Arabic, Rasasa means a bullet. But here we are talking about the metals. When they melt, they are called Muhl. So Muhl, one of the, uh, the, the definitions of it is any metal that's molten, any melted metal such as copper, uh, silver, and lead. Also, muhul means qatranun raqiq. You know, tur, when they, they, uh, they pave roads, they use tur. So when the tur is thin, it can easily flow, they call it muhul. So it is thin, light tur, which is not heavy, which is not thick. Also, it means zaytun raqiqun. So oil, which is thin, which can easily be poured. Also, al-muhul means Qayh, pus. You know when someone has a wound which festers, it will issue uh, pus. Especially pus, qayhun, min al mayit. Pus that issues from a dead person. Then we have this word ihin. 
and the plural of, his, of it is uhun. So generally, ihin means suf, and suf means wool. So if you hear someone say ihin, it means wool. But specifically, it means sufun masbughun alwana. So wool, which is dyed into different colors. So you dye the wool, it assumes different colors. So in this case, we call it ihin. It also means asuful ahmar. So red wool. So when it's colored red, it's called uh, ihin. Then we have hamim. It means qaribun aw sadiqun tuhibbuhu wa yuhibbuk. So your close relative, your close friend, whom you love and who loves you. So in so many cases, two friends do not love one another the same. So maybe one friend loves the other 100%. The other one loves him 70%, 60%. But when we say hamim, these are hearty, bosom, intimate friends. They love one another the same. 100%, 100%. So in this case, we call them hamim, qaribun, tuhibbuhu wa yuhibbuk. So a relative or a friend whom you love and who loves you. And we will see how these words will come into play when we explain the verses. Um, if we go back to verse number five, can anyone volunteer to read it even in English? If we go back to verse number five, can anyone volunteer to read verse number five either in Arabic or in English? Volunteering to read verse number five in English or Arabic. Can anyone volunteer? Yes, sister. But have patience, O prophet, beautiful patience. Yeah, so we talked about this about patience. We said in Arabic there is what they call al maf'ul al mutlaq. This is when you bring a noun from a verb. In English, it's, it's called cognate accusative. But in English, cognate accusative doesn't work according to the English grammar structure. So in this case, we have to rephrase the sentence. And we said before, so patiently persevere without complaining. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to persevere and to be patient without complaining. So this is a problem with translation. Sometimes they want to employ the same Arabic structure in the translation into English which cannot render meaning. So if you didn't read the tafsir, when someone says or tells you, so be patient, a beautiful patient, you won't understand what he means. So according to Mufassirin, interpreters of the Quran, it means to be patient without complaining. You only complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some of them go to the extent of saying, you have a problem. You've been stricken by calamities. No one knows about it because you are hiding your problems. You only complain to Allah subhanahu wa Ta'ala seeking his assistance, seeking his help. And we did talk about this, that some people even who claim to be your friends, when you have problems, they will rejoice in that. They will enjoy you having problems, the, pe the people whom you call your friends. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu and tells us that we have to be patient. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in so many cases, whenever he instructs us to do something, he is at the forefront of doing it. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he himself is patient. According to a hadith that was narrated by Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما أحد أصبر على أذى سمعه من الله تعالى. No one will patiently persevere when he hears things that annoy him more than Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. يدعون له الولد. They ascribe children to him. They claim that Allah has a child. They claim that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has a wife. Some denominations of some religions yet. He continues to give them sustenance and to give them good health. So, so long as you are still on the earth, you didn't die, no matter what you say about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter whether you believe or you don't, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still give you good health and will still give you sustenance. And if you repent before you die, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you. Not only does he forgive you, he turns your sins into rewards. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, when people blaspheme him, they annoy him, he will continuously give them. He will continu continuously bless them with good health. But he's waiting for them on the day of judgment, especially if they die before they repent to him. So as we said before, how many people would do that? Someone who gave you a job, someone who has been generous to you, instead of being grateful to him, you blaspheme him, you talk negatively about him, and he gets the news, will he continue to be good to you? A, few, a very few of them, even Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, 
one of the most sincere bona fide companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he fell into this trap when people spread rumors about Aisha accusing her of extramarital affairs one of them was Mr. who was supported by Abu Bakr so Abu Bakr was angry saying you Mr. I support you I help you and now you are among the people peddling rumors against my daughter I will stop supporting you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala castigated him he said continue giving him because by supporting him by giving him you are doing that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Abu Bakr said I will continue supporting him so a few of them would still continue doing good things to those people who blaspheme them who uh, tarnish their reputation the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the messenger of Allah was at the forefront of being patient in so many ways they harmed him annoyed him tried to tarnish his reputation ridiculed him but he was patient and actually there is a time when Ab um, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was in a company of the Ansar he was talking to them they were discussing a few things the Ansar these are the people who generously welcomed the immigrants who immigrated from Mecca to Medina they were so generous to them they were ready to share everything with their, with their brothers who immigrated from Mecca to Medina so there is a time especially after the battle of Hunayn the Prophet Wasallam was distributing the spoils and the booty of the battle and he was distributing always the booty according to his wisdom there was uh, w there was a reason why he gave so and so and he didn't give so and so and all these reasons were for the sake of Islam so some of the Ansar who didn't get anything from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after the battle of Hunayn they were complaining they were gossiping saying, say, saying you know the messenger of Allah this time in his in his distribution of the spoils of war he was not fair and he didn't seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they were accusing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa of not seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in distributing the booty and the spoils from the battle of Hunayn so Abdullah bin Mas'ud said I will inform the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa of what these people have been saying so Abdullah bin Mas'ud rushed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he Talk, he um, he whispered something in his ear, in the ear of the Prophet Sallallahu that you know people are saying you distributed unfairly, you didn't seek the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam changed. He was very angry. His face became red because in his distribution he had wisdom. There was something that he was looking for. So this person to accuse him that he never was looking for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his distribution, he became angry. But after some time he came back to his senses. He said, لَقَدْ أُوذِيَ مُوسَى بِأَكْثَرَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ فَصَبَرَ So Musa alayhi salam was harmed, was annoyed by more than this. But he patiently persevered. So the Prophet ﷺ chose to be patient. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is confirming the Prophet to the Prophet ﷺ that if you are patient, you will get a lot of rewards. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, Fasbir sabran jamila. Patiently persevere without complaining. If they belie you, if they accuse you, if they tarnish your reputation, if they deny the day of judgment, if they deny the punishment on the day of judgment, or even the punishment on earth, be patient, patiently persevere. Now the question is, was the Prophet ﷺ complaining? So Allah tells him, Fasbir sobran jamila. So be patient without complaining. Was the Prophet ﷺ complaining to Allah about the disbelievers, about the harm that they meted out to him, about the problems he was suffering? So did he complain so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would instruct him to be patient? Did he complain? No, the Prophet ﷺ never complained. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only talking to the Prophet ﷺ, he is talking to us as well that as a Muslim people will blaspheme you without any reason people will hate you without any reason as we see today some people castigating Islam and Muslims for no apparent reason so don't lose hope don't say because this person is power is in power he has authority he's speaking negatively against Islam and Muslims so we will stop doing da'wah so don't be dejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does things in a way that we don't presume, that we don't even expect. So don't lose hope. Don't complain. 
you will prevail whether uh, whether shortly or after some time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with you so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not only addressing the Prophet sallallahu he was addressing us as well even if you are a passive Muslim you say I will not do da'wah I will not pray for you just bearing the Islamic name people will hate you just for that so continue living your life as a Muslim continue doing da'wah to the non-Muslims following the path of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will support you so how many categories is patience dis divided patience is divided into three categories does anyone know any one of these three categories of patience does anyone know any one of them so patience in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not easy to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example as we said before it's very difficult for some people to wake up in the morning before sunrise to go and pray in the masjid Salat al-Fajr it's very difficult so if you go to a masjid during Salat al-Dhuhr Salat al-Maghrib Salat al-Isha you will find a lot of people but go to the masjid during Salat al-Fajr and Salat al-Asr you'll find two three people it's very difficult giving charity is very difficult you know people might claim you know I am loyal to you if you have a problem come to me if there is anyone who needs help come to me I will donate some money you go to them you don't see them they start coming up with flimsy excuses this is why it's called sadaqa which comes from sidq which is to show the truth that you really believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so to be patient in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will be rewarded for that even if it's not difficult for you some people will stigmatize you some people will try to tarnish your reputation just because you are a righteous person so sometimes some people would say you know he claims to be a pious person let, let us do this let us try him by this way let us do this so they are always uh, trying to tempt you but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you are patient he will reward you abundantly and he will be on your side so patience in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala another category of worship of patience during calamities to be patient during calamities your father dies your brother dies your grandmother dies so you patiently persevere because you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created them in the first place so you were born after your father was born and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who decided to take him so you don't complain you can be sad you can cry but you don't say any negative statements against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so if a calamity strikes you whether it's loss of your children loss of wealth uh, if you are suffering from diseases if you are tortured by some people because of your faith you be patient Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you abundantly so the third the third one the third one uh, this is uh, if this is under patience during calamities the third one is to be patient to avoid sins so you patiently persevere in avoiding sins so someone for example likes to take bribes so you patiently persevere you say no even if my salary is small I will not take bribe someone for example likes to commit adultery you say no I won't do that someone is enticing you to drink alcohol to smoke you say no so avoiding sins requires patience and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran Surah Al-Zumar chapter 39 verse number 10 إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرُهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حساب. Indeed those who patiently persevere they will be given their reward without measure so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you abundantly so in life we need patience even in every aspect of life if you patiently persevere you will prosper and as we said before sometimes you feel lazy something that you can do within two minutes because you are lazy you're not patient you are quick it will cost you a lot of hours and a lot of things so patient will reward you so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says innahum yarawnahu ba'ida indeed those disbelievers they they perceive the torture and punishment on the day of judgment as far off they consider it impossible it will never happen they don't believe in it it doesn't come to their mind that you know someone when he's dead when his body is decomposed time will come when this person will be resurrected they don't buy it they don't believe in it so they presume that the day of judgment will never happen it's impossible so means they they deem it inconceivable far off 
far-fetched. It will never happen. So, which means, I, which means, Yara al-Kafaratu wal mushrikun The disbelievers and the polytheists, they perceive and they see, Wuqo al-Adhaad, the striking of punishment, mustahilan, impossible. So they see it, they perceive it, they consider it impossible. It's an impossibility to them. So they were claiming that just the Prophet ﷺ was threatening them. And this is one of the reasons where they would say, you know, this punishment that you are threatening us with, bring it now, let it strike us now. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, be patient. Even if they deny it, time will come. Al-A'mash, one of the interpreters of the Quran says, يَرَوْنَ الْبَعْثَ بَعِيدًا So they perceive the resurrection as far off. As impossible, impracticable, it can't be practiced, and feasible. There is no way it can happen according to them. So they deem it very far to the extent that they claim it's impossible. Because they don't believe in it. So they don't believe in it, they don't buy it. There is no way they believe that time will come when they will be tortured or time will come when the world will end. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing the Prophet sallallahu be patient even if they don't believe in the day of judgment, they don't believe in punishment, they continuously uh, tarnish your reputation, disbelieve in you, just be patient. قال المفسرون, majority of the interpreters of the Quran say, إنما أخبر الله عز وجل Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to whom belongs might and majesty informed us, declared, أَنَّهُمْ يَرَوْنَ ذَلِكَ بَعِيدًا that the disbelievers consider the day of judgment very far off, um, unfeasible, لِأَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا لَا يُصَدِّقُونَ بِهِ because they were not believing that this day, the day of judgment is true, or that the punishment on this earth or on the day of judgment is true. So what they don't believe in, they just don't consider that it will happen. So Tony, do you mind reading to us Surah, to us, surah Al-Kahf? Chapter 18, verse 29. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's telling him, وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنُ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرُ إِنَّا أَعْتَدْنَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ نَارًا أَحَاطَ بِهِمْ سُرَادِقُهَا So, and say, the truth is from your Lord, from Allah. So whoever wills, let him believe. And whoever wills, let him disbelieve. Indeed, we prepared for the wrongdoers a fire whose walls will surround them. So the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is comforting the Prophet wasallam. Don't care if they don't believe in the day of judgment, if they don't believe in punishment, if they continuously tarnish your reputation. Don't worry. It's like, for example, if you work in a company and there is a bully, Someone bullies you, you do your work, you do your best. Someone is fickle and finicky. So you go and complain to your CEO or to your manager and the manager tells you, just be patient a few days. Some changes are going to happen. So you will be happy because you know either they will promote you or they will take you to another department or they will take you to another franchise or they will fire that person. You rest assured that something is going to be done. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is comforting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Although the Prophet ﷺ was very confident, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, co- is uh, confirming what the Prophet ﷺ already, uh, the, uh, confirming the situation or confirming uh, one of the attributes that the Prophet ﷺ already has. And actually, as parents, as managers, as leaders, in whatever capacity in which we are, there is something we benefit from here. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't complain. The Prophet ﷺ was always patient, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still tells him, be patient. Indeed, time will come when they will be punished. What lesson do we learn from this? There are some lessons that we learn from this. Among the lessons that we learn from this, if your child or your employee does something remarkable, comes up with something good, good behavior, good work, don't claim you didn't, don't pretend you didn't see it. You have to comment on it. So you have to, uh, to emphasize, the, to reward him for what he does, or at least to emphasize the behavior, or to give, an, uh, to give him an impression that you noticed what he did. Don't neglect him or her, because if you neglect him, he will give up. So you need to encourage someone who does something uh, good out of his own goodwill. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is motivating the Prophet sallallahu is encouraging the Prophet sallallahu that what you're doing is good. Continue doing that. So the aim is continuously be patient. Time will come 
when they will be punished. Time will come when whatever they enjoy will be in ruin. So this gives motivation to the Prophet ﷺ. He's already patient, but this one gives him more confidence. And when he stands up to speak to the polytheists, he will be filled up with confidence. So uh, rewarding someone who does something notable, the, um, uh, uh, giving an impression that you are uh, you appreciate what this person is doing it's very important in whatever capacity we are because always human beings they need to be noticed they may need to be encouraged they need to be rewarded for whatever they do and the rewarding someone comes in different shapes not only in monetary terms a word of encouragement could be a reward so there are many ways of rewarding a person so in whatever capacity you are always encourage the people who work with you or the people who who are under you and this will be one of the motivations so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him continuously tells him wanarahu qariba so the disbelievers the polytheists they consider the day of judgment they consider punishment in the hereafter as distant as inconceivable, it will never happen, as impossible. Wanarahu Kariba, yet we see it quite near. Now Wanarahu Kariba, this noon, this Vamir, this pronoun, it goes back either to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to the believers. So according to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the infinite wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's very near. As we said before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not restricted by time or by distance. So for, for us, what we see as very far, according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's very, very near. So there is no restrictions on Allah in terms of time and in terms of distance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perceives this day as quite near. But he might prolong it because he wants people to repent to our benefit. Not because he's not able to do that. Or not because he's mobilizing forces to help him in order to judge people on this day. If he delays it, it's because of us. He's very uh, kind to us. So the meaning is, I. it means, So the believers believe in their hearts, certainly, Kaunahu qariba that it will happen soon, the day of judgment. Wa in kana lahu amadun la yalamhu illa Allah. Although there is an appointed time for it, Allah subhanahu wa taala has set a time in which the day of judgment will happen. So we don't know when it will be. It might be tomorrow or after tomorrow. But what we are required to do is to believe that it will happen. Only Allah subhanahu wa taala knows exactly when it will happen. Wa qila it was also said. Ainarahu Hayinan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that you see, as Allah, I perceive it very easy, very simple for that day to occur. Fi Qudratina, based on my capability, my ability, infinite ability with no limits. Our abilities, our capabilities are limited. The abilities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his capabilities are not limited. They are infinite, boundless. So based on Allah's capability. غَيْرَ متعسرين. It's not very difficult. وَلَا متعذرين. And it's not unfeasible. It will, it, it's probable. It will happen. وَالْجُمْلَ And this verse or sentence تَعْلِيلٌ لِلْأَمْرِ بِالصَّبْرِ So this sentence therefore is, um, is, a, is a way of justifying and explaining why he enjoined upon the Prophet ﷺ to patiently persevere. So why should the Prophet ﷺ persevere? Why should we patiently persevere? Because the day of judgment is near. So those who deny it, time will come soon. When they will regret. When it will be too late for them. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَنَرَاهُ We see it. Because when you see something, it's something that exists. You can't see something which does not exist. But for us, we consider that it will happen. Now, Wanarahu, he's talking in terms of plural. Why didn't say he? Di why didn't he say Wanarahu Kariba? I see it because he's one. But here he says Wanarahu Kariba. So we said before this verse has two interpretations. Either Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says. He sees it to be near the day of judgment and the punishment. Or the believers say we see it quite near. Now we consider it quite near. So noon il jama. Why is it in plural? Why didn't he say wa arahu? Why did he use the noon we? No, uh, we inter if we interpret it to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking. So why did he use the noon? Uh, it, it's the plural of majesty. 
the plural of majesty as we said for example if a king or a ruler or a president or whoever person is in power when they stand up and announce and say we've decided it means the we of majesty and in most cases when they say we've decided this person has consulted with a lot of people so it's not only his idea it's the idea of a lot of people but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not consult with anyone in some languages it's the we of majesty for example do we have anyone who speaks French any French speaking person for example in French if you are talking to an ordinary person if you say you you say toi but if this person has position or the person you respect, you say vu. And actually vu it's for you in plural. Toa is for you in singular. But if this person is respectable, you don't say toa. He would be offended. So you say vu. So it's the plural here of majesty and respect. Because you're respecting this person, you are addressing him as vu. And actually vu means you in plural. And toa means you as singular. So what else? So the we of majesty. Yes, Hudayfa? So a lot of consideration. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kind. The most forgiving. Uh, the Lord, the cherisher, the provider. So he says in our provision, in our kindness. So all the, all the attributes and names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come into consideration. So we see it as near. But because I am kind to you, I just... Uh, let you do whatever you can if you repent I will forgive you so it's the we into putting the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into consideration the most merciful the most kind uh, the considerate uh, the most able so all these names and attributions when they come into play so he says we so not only because if he says I it would mean just I am bent on punishing punishing but no Yes, he's severe in punishment. At the same time, he's the most merciful. So if you consider the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you do not lose hope. But for example, if it's a human being, you wronged this person, you persecuted him when he was weak and you were stronger, when you are in power, this person will be in trouble. And actually in Arabic, they tell us, I'll just translate the proverb, that beware of a weak person when he becomes powerful. A weak person whom you wronged when he becomes powerful. Or a person has, um, has a low, who has a low esteem. This person who has low esteem, when he comes in power, it will be trouble because he wants to show off. He wants to prove, you know, people think that I'm not powerful. I want to show my strength. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't like that. So whatever you do, if you repent to him, he is the most forgiving. So this we is the we of majesty. It's also the we of consideration, putting a lot of things into consideration. Qala ibn Juraj, ibn Juraj, one, ibn, ibn Juraj, one of the interpreters of the Quran says, Innahum yarawnahu ba'ida. Indeed, the disbelievers perceive the day of judgment to be impossible, to be far off. To be inconceivable, to be unfeasible, be takzibihim iyahu, just by denying it. Not necessarily do they have to say that, you know, it's not possible, but by belying it. So the Prophet ﷺ tells them, time will come when you will be responsible, when you will be accountable for everything that you do. They say, no, no, when will it happen? It will never happen. How can someone who has died and his body has decomposed, how will he come to life again? So by that attitude, they are actually perceiving that the day of judgment will not happen. وَنَرَاهُ قَرِيبًا صُدْقًا كَائِنًا So, and the believers... On the other side, the believers, we see that certainly this day will happen. So, Tony, do you mind reading to us chapter um, 56, verses 1 to 6, Surah Al-Waqi'ah? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا وَقَعَتِ الْوَاقِعَةِ لَيْسَ لِوَقَعَتِهَا كَاذِبًا خَافِضَةٌ رَافِعًا um, so إِذَا رُجَّتِ الْأَرْضُ رَجَّةٌ وَبُسَّتِ الْجِبَالُ بَسَّةٌ فَكَانَتْ هَبَاءً مُنْبَثَّةٌ When the heavy occurrence of the day of judgment comes to happen there is there is at its occurrence no denial so there is no denial no one can deny the happening of the day of judgment it will bring down some people and will raise others so some people who were arrogant on this earth because of their power because of their wealth because of their connections because of whatsoever uh, properties they had or whatsoever skills or, or anything they had that made them superior 
on the day of judgment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make them law he will depress them and those people who were perceived as weak inconsiderable as nobodies on the day of judgment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise them and actually in a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring a person who enjoyed all the comfort of life all the amenities of life and people were looking up to him people were admiring him so the most enjoying person who enjoyed everything no one enjoyed like him this person will be immersed for a minute in the hellfire then he will be asked have you ever seen any enjoyment he will say no so just one minute of the hellfire will make him forget everything that he enjoyed on earth so even the luxury of enjoyment you know sometimes when you become sad when you're suffering from stress they always say that you should reminisce your memories so if you visited a very beautiful island if you had good times with someone or somebody so you remember so these images will boost your morale they will make you happy so in the hellfire there is no luxury of bringing up memories of the past you forget everything and a person on the other hand who was suffering the most everyone was looking down upon him no one even wanted to look at him twice he was a miserable person the most miserable person on earth yet in front of Allah this person had value he was worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he was afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will be immersed in for one minute in, in paradise then he will be taken out they will ask him have you ever suffered from any misery he will say no so he will have for the uh, the bliss of paradise will make him forget all the mirrors the mirrors the misery that he went through so whatever is done here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is going to pay back especially those people who did not worship him with uh, with sincerity so uh, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after talking about the day of judgment those who be light and confirming to the Prophet sallallahu and to the believers that um, undoubtedly it will happen now he speaks about some of the signs of the day of judgment there are major signs and there are minor signs of the day of judgment so remember a day hereafter on the day of judgment when this heaven when the sky will be like molten brass we said brass uh, we said al muhul is uh, any of the metals or minerals when they melt whether it's copper lead or gold or silver when you melt them they are called muhul so this heaven that we see up the sky that we see it will melt on the day of judgment it will be like brass which is molten and actually those of you uh, who have never seen brass actually this is a picture of um, of a vessel made of brass so you can you can pass it and actually um, according to definition they say brass is a metal alloy made of copper and zinc so you mix copper and alloy is when you mix two metals or two minerals so whatever is produced after mixing two minerals or metals it's called the alloy so brass is an is a metal alloy made of copper and zinc so copper and zinc when they melt this is ahin so the heaven that you see up the, the beautiful sky during winter during autumn which is blue sometimes on the day of judgment it, it's going to be like molten brass ibn abbas says the sediments you know when you have oil and then you burn the oil the remnants that stay down these are called sediments of oil so it will be some of them say it will be like molten brass some of them say it will be like molten like sediments of oil and the blackness of sweat because of the fear on the day of, of, of judgment so due to the horrors and the terrors that will happen on the day of judgment the the sweat that will issue from people will be black black sweat coming out from a person because of fear so that is how the heaven will be Ibn Mas'ud says Ma min rasas. so ihin is whatever is melted of lead or copper or silver so when you melt copper silver or any other mineral or metal whatever happens after the, you melt them that's called ihin and that's how the heavens will be Qatada says on the day of judgment the heaven will change colors 
Laun and Akhar, it will assume another color which is close to red, which will be inclining towards red. So the heaven that we see today, uh, sometimes um, navy blue, sometimes blue, it will change on the day of judgment. It will assume a color that will be red, which shows that there is danger. So, Tony, before we continue, can you read to us um, chapter 44, Surah al dukhan verses 43 to 46. So, Allah subhanahu, so, according to some interpretations, the heaven on the day of judgment will be like molten brass. And the food of the people who will be consigned to the hellfire will be molten brass. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna shajarat al-zakum ta'amul athim. Indeed, the tree of zakum, which is an infernal tree with bitter fruits, is food for the sinful. It's like murky oil. It boils within bellies. So you eat it, it boils inside. Like the boiling of scalding water. So when you heat water to, ex to an extreme temperature, so this scalding water is like the food that will be given to the people of, uh, to the denizens or the residents of the hellfire. So the heaven will be like molten brass. The food that people will be given will be like molten brass. And, the, and incidentally, the drinks that will be given to people will be like molten brass. So it will be horrible on that day. Nothing else to help you except your good deeds. وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَالْعِهْنِ And the mountains will be like carded wool. So the picture that I gave you, it's wool, that, a fluffy wool. So you, you make it into fluff. So we'll see. قَالَ مُجَاهِدْ كَالسُّفِ الْمَنْقُشْ Carded wool. You know, a carder, when they will, they will make wool, into, they will turn it into fluffs. Maybe they want to make something. So these mountains, solid, strong mountains that are firmaments according to some verses that are holding the earth from shaking that they serve as pegs on the earth and we said before according to some ge geologists they say that the same height of the mountain up is the same downward so this is this is the earth so if it's 6,000 meters high it's 6,000 meters below the earth so that it stays firm so these mountains will be reduced to carded wool and it will be flying over. Waqila it was said, Ay kasufil masbugh. So the mountains that we see staying firm, that do not move, they will be reduced to uh, something like wool which is dyed, dyed wool which is paint which is dyed into different colors so interpreters of the quran who also know something about the uh, who know a lot about the arabic language they say uh, wool cannot be called in arabic unless it's dyed it's colored so when it assumes different colors this is when they call it so the mountains will be like a fluffy wool flying over us Al Hassan al Basri says, Takunu al Jibalu kasuf al Ahmar. So the mountains will be like red wool, wa huwa al-Dhafu Suf. And this is the weakest of wool. So the weakest wool is the one which is red. So you imagine fluffs of mountains being reduced to fluffs of wool flying over us. And actually some interpreters of the Quran, they say that the mountains will fly over. They will be very light, like when wind scatters fluffs of wool. So that will be the same as what will happen to the mountains. So Tony, do you mind reading to us Surah Al-Qari'ah, chapter 101, uh, verse 4 to 5? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَبْثُوثِ وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَالْعِهْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ Surah Al-Qari'ah. It's the day, the day of judgment, when people will be like moths, small insects, scattered, dispersed, scattered around. And the mountains will be like fluffed wool. So fluffs of wool, not, not even solid wool, those when it's reduced into fluffs. That's what will happen on the day of judgment. There will be a lot of horrible things taking place. وَلَا يَسْأَلُ حَمِيمٌ حَمِيمًا And actually we will talk much about this, this verse that we will end with. Um, because of the horrors of that day, a close friend, we said Hamim means Qarib, a close relative, an intimate relative, أو صديق, or a close friend, تُحِبُّهُ وَيُحِبُّكَ 
whom you love and loves you. And actually, when I was explaining this, I saw sisters love. Maybe they love one another hundred percent, right? You love her hundred percent, and she loves you hundred percent. On the day of judgment, you will not ask about one another. So what you can do is, what you have to do now is to make sure you earn rewards from her. You serve her, you get rewards from Allah. She serves you, she gets rewards from Allah. When she's stressed, you help her, you, will, you get rewards. So you are worshipping Allah by being her friend. She's worshipping Allah by being your friend. On the day of judgment, no friendship. And we will talk about that. So, a close relative, an intimate relative, a bosom relative, will not ask about the situation of his or her relative. Yet, he will be seeing his friend in the worst of conditions. So, you see your close friend suffering in the worst of conditions. You will not ask about them. You will not inquire about them. You will not ask them to help you. You will not even call them to come closer to you. Qala ibn Abbas says, يَعْرِفُ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضَ ثُمَّ يَفِرُونَ So they will know one another, recognize one another, then they will flee from one another. Now, this one, we are going to talk about this. Why do you think friends will be running away from one another? The, uh, so, one reason, it's because of the terrors and horrors of that day. So, the day when they see the major signs of the day of judgment, mountains that will have been reduced to fluffs of wool flying over the heaven like molten brass, and um, the, the, the seas and oceans will be dry, a lot of things will happen, so everyone will be preoccupied with his destination. Everyone wants to know what will happen to him. No one has time to think about another. That's one. Number two. Let me read to you these verses. Maybe they can give, um, they can give us clues. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Zukhruf says, Are they waiting? Alluding to the disbelievers, to the sinners, are they waiting except for the hour to come upon them suddenly while they perceive not? So while they don't expect it, it will come to them. Close friends that day will be enemies to one another except for the righteous people. So close friends will be enemies to one another on that day except for the righteous people. So why do you think close friends will be enemies? Except for the righteous, except for the righteous people. So close friends will be enemies except for the righteous people. Why will they be enemies? Yes, they know. Everyone wants to go to paradise. So everyone is preoccupied with. Yeah. So you think that some maybe someone will come to you to ask for deeds. So and you need even the smallest deed. You need it. That's another answer. Another one. Yes, sister. Yes, they will blame each other. I wanted to pray, you dissuaded me. I wanted to give charity, you dissuaded me. You were accusing the recipients. I wanted to do good deeds, you are not a real friend. So they will be blaming one another and as such they will be enemies. A friend who used to be a, to claim as your friend, you will realize on the day of judgment that he wasn't a friend. He was disguising as a friend, yet he was an agent of shaitan. So uh, another reason why would the uh, with, fri with friends actually in another hadith which was, narr which was uh, narrated by Abu Bakr and uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ كُلُّ جَسَدٍ نَبَتَ مِنْ سُحْتٍ فَالنَّارُ أَوْلَى بِهِ any flesh that grew up being nourished by food which was ill gotten the food the money is gotten from illicit activities you buy food and you nourish someone with this food this person is more appropriate to be punished burning in the hell fire so this means a father who claimed he loved his daughters he loved his children he was stealing to bring food he was killing to bring food deceiving to bring food so this brings us to a point that sometimes you claim you love your people but you don't love them a father claims he loves his son but he doesn't ostensibly we think that he loves us because of what he does but internally he doesn't love us can, can anyone tell us how uh, ma maslaha 
So uh, maybe a father wants to get someone f something from the son. This way he claims he loves him. Yeah, this could be, but in most cases, ostensibly, we show them we love them, yet we don't love, yet, based on what we do, we don't really love them. The example is, so how do you claim you love someone when you stole the money and you, and you bought food to nourish your son? Yet you know that on the day of judgment, you will be responsible, you will be asked, so why do you feed the person you love the food which is haram? Can anyone give poison to his son, to his mother, to his father? So why do you steal to, bring, to buy food, bring it on the table on which your children will feed, on which your wife will feed? So, kullu jismin, kullu jasadin, nabata min suhd. A suhd, actually, according to Arabic, is al-malul haram. So, ill-gotten wealth. So you steal, you cheat, you lie, you buy food, you buy gifts to your wife, you want to impress her. And Miskina, she says, you know, she goes in public in front of her. My, my husband loves me every time he brings me clothes, every time he buys me the food that I like. He built for me a house. She's, she's arrogant, she's boasting about what she gets. On the day of judgment, she will come to discover it was haram. So what will she do? Miskina. Children miskin. So, yes, la yes alu hamimun hamima, friends will run away from one another. And actually, it continues. People will seek to run from their own family members. So, you want to give out to your father, your mother, your children, so that you be safe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a hadith that was narrated by the Prophet, وسلم, the Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, will tell. The least person who will be punished in the day, on the day of judgment. Um, so a person who will receive the least punishment, the slightest punishment on the day of judgment. In a hadith that was narrated by Anas ibn Malik. Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala, Inna allaha yaqulu li ahwani ahli nari azaba. Law anna laka ma fil ard min shay'in, kunta taftali bih? Qala na'am. قال فقد سألتك ما هو أهون من هذا أن لا تشرك بي شيئا فأبيت إلا الشرك سروح البخاري so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask a person who will be punished the least if you had everything on earth to pay in order to be safe from the punishment today would you give it the person will say yes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell him you know I had asked you a little it's just a simple thing not to associate partners with me to worship only me but you refused you insisted on worshiping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it doesn't take you money to worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you don't have to pay money you don't have to pay fees just you say la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah and you become a muslim you become a believer so worshiping only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a lot of rewards and not worshiping only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, will put you into hell so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was always warning us so kullu jasadin dabata min suht fannaru awla bih every flesh that's nourished by money that was ill gotten it's the most appropriate to be punished in the hell fire so wala yas'alu hamimun hamima no one will ask about his friend no one will ask for his friend no one will will ask uh, for his friend to be brought no one will ask will uh, just even want to know where his friend is and actually in surah abasa allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us he says everyone on the day of judgment so a day when you will flee from your your brother your mother your father your sister your children everyone will be preoccupied with something that will scare him everyone is concerned about his deeds so you don't care about your mother you don't care about your father you don't care about your friends what you are concerned about is your deeds so actually in a had in in another ayah so best friends, bosom friends, intimate friends on earth on the day of judgment will be enemies except the righteous. So this is a wake up call that if you want to take a friend, take a friend who is a righteous person because your friendship will help you here and in the hereafter. But if you take a friend who is always encouraging you to commit sins, then this is not a friend. He will affect you on earth and he will also cause you a lot of misery on the day of judgment. And actually, you know, sometimes when people commit sins, they claim it's shaitan. Someone might sin 
might steal. When you ask him, Shaitan tempted me. Have you ever seen the Shaitan? Did he talk to you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what will happen in the day of judgment. He says, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانِ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُ أَنفُسَكُمْ مَا أَنَا بِمُصْرِخِكُمْ وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمُصْرِخِيَّ إِنِّي كَفَرْتُ بِمَا أَشْرَكْتُمُونِ مِنْ قَبْلِ إِنَّ الظَّالِمِينَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ So it's translated and Satan will say when the matter has been concluded, the day of judgment has happened, people see punishment. Indeed Allah has promised you the promise of truth. So the, the shaitan will acknowledge Allah promised you the promise of truth and I promised you but I betrayed you but I had no authority over you and actually what they mean by authority here two things authority of power to force you to do sins to commit sins or to convince you to commit sins now did the shaitan force you push you go and kill go and steal did you see him or did the shaitan convince you that you know if you steal you will get money you will do this neither of them happened so the shaitan will be right he will say i didn't have any authority over you except that i invited you to commit sins and you res you responded so do not blame me but blame yourselves and this is double punishment you know someone who has been encouraging you to do something and then at the last minute he rejects you he distances himself from you this is double punishment so who will be there for you at least if both of you commit sins and support one another but in the day of judgment know that support and this will add to your punishment the people whom you were enjoying with who were tempting you who were encouraging you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they will be aloof from you they will stay away from you the devil will disclaim you so you will be alone and the, dev the devil shaitan will blame you so most of the time shaitan Someone commits sin, shaitan. Did you, did you see him? Even during Ramadan, when the, the ahadith tell us that the shaitan is fettered, is chained, people still commit sins. So which shaitan is there? Encourage you to commit sins. So it's to blame yourself. So the shaitan is a scapegoat for many people. On the day of judgment, he's going to disclaim that he was uh, encouraging you to commit sins. So any questions? Any comments? Yes, yes, sister. Okay, so, so, this is the on judgment day. Mm -hmm. Some people will be already dead. Right? Mm -hmm. And some will be alive. Actually, on the day of judgment, first of all, the trumpet will be blown. Everything on earth will die. Everything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything will die except Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be, will ask. Liman il mulkul yawm. Who has authority today? No one to answer. And then the trumpet will be blown the second time, everyone will resurrect. So all of us will be resurrected to be questioned in one place, to be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on the, after the blowing of the second trumpet, all of us will come to life again. Yeah, as we are human beings. So even if you died a kid, and actually there is a hadith, at judgment day, kids will have their own procedures because if they died before puberty, they will go to paradise. They will not be asked because they died while young. Some other narrations, some other opinions say that Allah will give them a test. But majority of the scholars say that those who died, whether they are children of kuffar, of non-believers, they will go straight away to paradise. So what will happen is the souls will be returned. And when the souls will be returned to their bodies on the day of judgment. However... No one will go to paradise when young and no one will go to paradise when old. You know, uh, Prophet Muhammad sallam, there is a lady who went to him. She was an old lady. She wanted to ask about things that will qualify her to go to paradise. So what shall I do to enter paradise? The Prophet told her, uh, no old man or woman will go to paradise. She started crying. So does anyone know what happened? Yes, Udayfa? Yeah, so uh, when we go to paradise, all of us will be yeah, middle-aged, between the age of 30 and 33. So someone who died at the age of 100 in paradise will be 33. Someone who was young, he will be 33. So Uruban Atraba. So we will be young, middle-aged, at the same time, we will be uh, on, at the same age. So in the paradise, yes, but during judgment, 
uh, ages will matter because they want to know who at this age uh, did what so that the ch yeah, at resurrection but when you go to paradise you go at the age of 33 years yes sister who okay if you know very well that your father is a thief that your father is a lie is a, is a cheater is a liar and you still take money from him knowingly that he killed someone he lied to someone then you'll be also responsible but if you don't know he he will go he will be responsible alone so uh, we have a lot of situations of sahaba the tabi'in the righteous people the children would not eat the wife would not eat any food until she was she was assured that this money is halal how many women of the sahaba would ask from where did you get the money they wanted to know so if for example you know that your your father is a professional killer a professional thief you know that he goes out with the gun to kill people you know it very well and yet you eat the food you'll be responsible for that but if you don't then he alone is responsible no one will bear the burdens of another everyone will be responsible for his own burdens any other comments or questions about uh, actually uh, there are some verses if you want I can uh, send them to you there are some verses and a hadith I will send them to you inshallah so you can read them by, by yourself about shajarat al zakum inshallah I will do that uh, what else? Okay, the sister asked a question about uh, Karin. And uh, actually, it, uh, um, I think I will give you this paper, but I would like to clarify uh, some things. When we say Karin, mostly, mostly, it's the jinn who influences the person to commit sins. But there are some narrations which talk about a Karin among the angels. But mostly when people talk about Karin, it's the jinn who will always influence you to disobey Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِي جَعَلَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر فَأَلْقِيَاهُ فِي الْعَذَابِ الشَّدِيدِ قَالَ قَارِينُهُ رَبَّنَا مَا أَطْغَيْتُهُ وَلَكِنْ كَانَ فِي ضَلَالٍ بَعِيدٍ قَالَ لَا تَخْتَصِمُوا لَدَيْهِ وَقَدْ قَدَّمْتُ إِلَيْكُمْ بِالْوَعِيدِ So who made, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who made equal? Um, the person, the mushrik, the polytheist, who made equals with Allah, who worshipped other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and treated them as equals. So you worship a tree, you worship a human being, you worship an idol, and you treat this person as Allah. You claim that he's your God, so you worship him, another deity, another person, another thing worthy to be worshipped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then this person will be thrown into severe punishment his devil companion, Karinu, his devil companion will say oh our lord, I did not make him transgress so the Karin, the devil companion according to the Quran will disclaim you that he himself was in extreme error so this Karin who was tempting you, who was encouraging you to commit sins he will also disclaim you so Allah will say do not dispute before me while I had already presented to you the warning so the Karin here is one alluding to the Karin Jinn who is always trying his best to influence the person to commit sins so um, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us له معقبات من بين يديه ومن خلف يحفظونه من أمر الله. so for each one among us are successive angels before and behind him who protect him by the decree of Allah subhanahu wa taala. so we have angels who protect us. we have a qarin among the angels. but mostly when they talk about qarin, it's the jinn. so the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in a hadith that was narrated by Abdullah bin Masood says. ما منكم من أحد إلا وقد وكل به قرينه من الجن قال وإياك يا رسول الله قال وإياي إلا أن الله أعانني عليه فأسلم فلا يأمرني إلا بخير غير أن في حديث سفيان وقد وكل به قرين من الجن وقرينه من الملائكة. so Allah the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says there is none amongst you we amongst you whom is not a companion among the jinn who will always influence him to do uh, wrong things so the companions asked even you O messenger of Allah he said even me but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has helped me my jinn devilish jinn companion has become a Muslim now this one also some scholars 
have different opinions. So we have, according to this hadith, we have Karin, a companion among the jinn, who is wicked, evil, always encouraging us to commit sins. On the other hand, we have a Karin among the malaika, who is encouraging us to do good deeds. So the Prophet told his companions, everyone has this Karin, even him, even the Prophet ﷺ, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped him and his Karin became a Muslim. Now there is here some scholars say that actually that Karin of the Prophet did not become a Muslim. What he did, he surrendered because the Prophet's faith was strong. He was protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this Karin was weak. He wouldn't influence the messenger of Allah. So he surrendered. So this is, this is what they mean for aslam, or what it means also it means I became secure from him. So the prophet was secure from that Karin because Allah helped him. So another narration said we have also Karin among the jinn, and another hadith which is also which is in Sahih Muslim, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam once went out at night. So Aisha was jealous. She thought maybe she, he was going to another woman. So she was uh, talking to him, trying to dissuade him, asking him questions. So he told her, has your shaitan influenced you? She asked, do I have a shaitan? He said, yes. And she asked, does every believer have a shaitan? He said, yes. Even you, he said, yes, except Allah has helped me. My devil or my jinn does not uh, encourage me to commit evil. What he does is to encourage me to do good deeds. So what happens is, is that you have a good Karin, Malaika, and a bad Karin among the jinn. So the Karin of the Prophet ﷺ, they say majority of the scholars, he did not become a Muslim per se, but he surrendered. And the Prophet was safe from his temptations. So regarding the question, when we die, where does the Karin go? As I expected, the scholars say that these things are among the unseen, ghaibiyat. We don't know there is no dalil from the Quran and from the Sunnah. So maybe Allah gave him another responsibility. And actually one of them said is, for example, you are a president, you are a ruler, you have bodyguards. When you die, where do they go? So they would go somewhere else. So they said that maybe Allah gives them another job, but there is no hadith. They are just opinions. And we cannot base things like this on opinions. If there is... Beg your pardon? Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's a job, but this Karin of the Jinn is appointed to test us by Allah. Okay. So you have a Karin from the Jinn who is always encouraging you to do, commit sins. And, and on the other hand, you have an angel who is encouraging you to do good deeds. So if you, um, your faith is weaker, you will fall prey to the Karin. Even this Karin who is always encouraging you to commit sins will denounce you on the day of judgment. He will, yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, Allah knows. Even the disbelievers, they will say, we didn't commit anything. They will, they will disclaim in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, human beings, we are always, you know, for example, someone goes to a bank, he wants to steal money and they catch him red-handed. When you see him, say, you know, they are accusing me that I stole. Yet he was stealing, he, there is evidence. So it's difficult for a criminal to acknowledge, even in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will prove in different ways for everyone that you know you committed sins and until people will acknowledge when it will be too late, especially for the disbelievers. Um, any questions, any comments? Okay, see you inshallah on Thursday. We don't have Sira class. We have a trip to al Duaj Diwaniya. And of course you have, um, um, you can pick up the schedule and attend any event of your convenience. Jazakumullah khair. Yes, yes, you can go direct, but we prefer, we, we prefer you come here. If you know the place very well, if you can't get lost, yeah, because we are expecting 70 people and with every minute counts because they have an extensive program there. Yeah, yeah actually, we, are the bus, we, are, we have to meet here at 5 and the buses will start moving at 5.30. So by 6, we should be there. Yeah, inshallah. Yes, yes. Yeah, we'll pray here. Uh, you just send me a message okay. with your, your name. and I, Of course, I know your mobile number, just your name. Yeah, inshallah. Uh, two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, jazakumullah khair.